Hello, and welcome to the FI Entrepreneur, financial planning for the risk taker. This podcast will show you how to achieve FI through entrepreneurial pursuits by developing a well-calibrated and thought-out plan for risk management so that you can maximize the rewards. Hosted by certified financial planner, enrolled agent, and serial entrepreneur, Ben Martinek, this is the FI Entrepreneur, financial planning for the risk taker. The information presented in this podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only. None of the content is presented as investment advice. Consult your financial professional before acting on any of the information presented in this show. Hello and welcome to the FI Entrepreneur, Financial Planning for the Risk Taker. This is your host, Ben Martinek, along with my co-host today, Andrew Bensavanga. Andrew, why don't you chime in and say hi to everybody? Hi, everyone. How you doing? Hope everyone's doing well. If you guys don't know this, it's Andrew's late Friday evening, so he's already well into the weekend, and I'm just waking up to my morning cup of coffee. The time change, Andrew's ready to say goodbye to the work week, and I'm about to say goodbye too, <laughs> but I've still got another day to knock out ahead of me, <laughs> so I've got my cup of coffee. We're not quite so sure what Andrew's nursing over there, though. I don't know if it's coffee. I don't think so. <laughs> I actually, I got a new kind of tea, new for me. It's ash, ashwagandha something, something. I don't know. It's supposed to be stress relieving and balancing. It's one of those free radical destroying things. So it's keeping me healthy during tax season. (laughs) It is midnight over here. So I feel like it should be a beer or something a little bit stronger, but this will do for now. (laughs) Tax season is having its effect. Andrew's looking to take care of his health rather than destroy it. He's like, taxes are doing enough of that on me already. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. As I'm aging, I'm trying to get a little wiser and not just older and fatter. (laughs) <laughs> you and me both, brother. I was just having a conversation with Deb this morning about, I need like a multivitamin or something. I, what can we do to be helping me out here? I, so. Well, once you figure it out, we'll be in perfect shape because now this conversation is talking about the marketing of it. So once you figure out what that oh. pill is, we'll be well positioned to start marketing it and we'll know who to sell it to. Oh. So yeah, why don't you let us know, what are we talking about today, Ben? Yes, thank you, Andrew. We have a little bit of a segue there, and we are talking about marketing, but more specifically, a subset of marketing. We've got this notion of finding your avatar. So what does this mean? It's not like Finding Nemo off of, is it Pixar? Or who made Finding Nemo, do you know? I think so. I should know since we've watched that. I've got a four-year-old, <laughs> for those that don't know. We've watched that quite a bit. I think it is Pixar. But then Avatar was also another great movie, and we're going to stay away from all talk about movies. Okay. Because that's not what we're talking about. (laughs) You don't want to talk about Avatar. Well, we're not talking about that Avatar. That's what I'm trying to get at. We're not talking about little blue creatures running around in a mythical place that's being destroyed. What are we talking about when we mean finding your Avatar? I don't even know why they call it an Avatar within marketing circles, but that is the term that is used for finding your ideal client, like the person that you only are great creating and designing your business for. And if you recall in any of our prior episodes, the point of this whole business initiative is really to achieve financial independence. We see entrepreneurship as another pathway to achieving financial independence and not just another pathway, perhaps the best pathway, although it does have you know need for guardrails because entrepreneurship has its struggles for sure. But a key part of running a successful business is generating sales. You're not going to be in business for very long if you're not bringing in any revenue or any income. (laughs) So nothing too earth shattering there, but it is just the simple truth. But part of generating sales really is about working with people that really dig what you're doing, love your product, love your service. And the more they dig it, the more they're willing to pay for it, the better price you can offer for that product or service and only the better profit margin you can get, which is really the key, the throttle in this whole arrangement that makes this become a pathway for financial independence. So this notion of finding your avatar is just critical. I mean, it's really what you are building and designing your business for and around because the simple truth, as I let Andrew chime in on this in a moment, the simple truth is you can't work with everybody. When you first open the doors to your business, you might be like, oh, I'll just work with people. Like I'm a nice person or I'm a nice guy or gal and there's other nice guys and gals out there and I'm just gonna take care of people and it'll work itself out. And truth be told, I have been guilty of that thinking too. And I suppose to be fair to myself, it has worked out. So it's not as if that's a horrible motivation. All business only is people business. But there's 6 billion people, I don't know, 7 billion people in the world. And you can't possibly service all 6 or 7 billion people in the world, nor would you want to. So as much as you might just want to help people, 
you're really looking to help a very specific person, a very specific individual who is seeking out your service. And that very specific person, that's very specific individual is your avatar. That's who you're seeking to help. So what do you think of all that, Andrew? Have I set this up pretty well? I think you're much more eloquent than I could ever hope to be in speaking about avatars. <laughs> but what I really keyed into there was when you said you're trying to find these people that really dig what you're doing. And for me, I've always had a real love-hate relationship with marketing. I've always really struggled with it and struggled with putting energy towards it because I've always felt a little bit inauthentic when I just putting yourself out there and hawking your wares and saying, oh, come, come, come. You know, it always felt a little bit like BS to me. It wasn't like I was feeling true to myself. But I think that if you keep your avatar in mind and if you have that well fleshed out and you know who you're talking to, then I think that one, your message is going to be a lot more powerful. And two, you can also stay more true to yourself and hopefully be more authentic. And hopefully that kind of feeling will come through in the message that you're putting out there and your prospective clients will see that and then be more drawn to you. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's been a struggle of mine. It'll probably be a struggle of yours for whoever's listening to this, that business is only, <laughs> you've got to be okay with promoting yourself. <laughs> it's about getting your name out there. No one's going to do business with you if they don't know about you, if they're not aware that you exist. You got to make a name for yourself. And I can remember a few years ago when a financial advisor told me, but he was telling his kids that it's his life's ambition to be famous. And I thought, oh gosh, that feels just kind of vain. You know, like, why isn't there something more to life than just being famous? He's like, Ben, how how am I ever going to have a successful business if I'm not famous? Like, people need to know who I am. Like, yeah, it is my ambition to be famous. And I initially thought he was wrong, but I have come to realize that I was the one. <laughs> I was the wrong in error. It does have to be your ambition to be well-known, at least within the circle or the avatar, the community that you want people to be doing business with you in. If you have any shyness about this, you got to put that away, even if you are a bit of an introvert. Put that away. This is where that personality type that we talked about several episodes ago, in which the entrepreneur is this extrovert adventurer individual as defined, you know, within the personality types. Like that makes sense. Like this needs to be the person who goes out there and is willing to climb mountains and shake hands and kiss babies and all that stuff, right? Because no one's going to work with you if they don't know you, regardless of how good your product or service is. The other thing is getting people to know you as we refine the avatar is marketing at the end of the day is a lot like I kind of feel always bad about thinking of it this way, but it's just what most naturally comes to mind. It's a lot like hunting. If you're wanting to attract a certain fish or if you're wanting to attract a certain animal, you got to get to know that animal and you got to put out your lure or your bait that's going to draw that person in and make them interested in what it is that you're doing. And I certainly wouldn't want us to be thinking of other human beings as animals. It feels a little <laughs> objectifying and derogatory, but the practice of this, the principle of it is still fundamentally the same. Not everybody will be attracted to what you're doing. And more to the point, the more bland you are, the more you're non-distinctive, the more you're less outstanding, there's nothing really particular to you, the less likely anybody's going to bring attention or notice to you whatsoever. They won't be attracted to you in any regard. And business of any type, whether it's done as a brick and mortar or online, is about pulling people in and getting that foot traffic and having people take a look. So you have to stand out. You have to have something distinctive. You have to have a reason why they'd want to take notice of you. You know, that's part of learning who your avatar is. What are they interested in? What do they want? What are they looking for? Because otherwise, they're just going to look at you and walk right on by and never stop to take a closer look. Don't you think? I mean, what did you do, Andrew, in your business activities, especially the bar? Were there any particular exercises that you're undertaking to be more distinctive amongst your competition? Sure. There are a few things that we did. And that's a very specialized kind of business. And it's a very specialized kind of marketing that you're going to be doing for it. And I think that everyone has to think about what business am I in? Who am I targeting? And then how am I going to reach them? That's one of the most important parts about thinking about the avatar. You know, restaurants and bars, they do a lot of the kind of social media and stuff like that. Of course, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn and blogs and whatnot. One of the things that we really tried to do, especially in the early days, was be a part of the community and get involved with a lot of community building events, especially since one of our avatars were the expats that were here. So one of our avatars was really expats, which were typically in South Korea. It was English teachers that definitely have a little bit of discretionary cash. 
they're generally younger and most often from North America. So that was one of our avatars. The other one would have been also kind of younger Koreans that might have a little bit of experience traveling abroad and are at least open to the idea of trying a new product as ours was. So we would try to be where they were and participate in just any event that was around the city or around the country that would bring those people together and just have our name and our product in front of them. Let's give a little more detail. So, I mean, your product and service, you were selling basically selling beer, but American food, right? That also, yep. So, and then how was that distinctive? I've never been to South Korea. I can't imagine there aren't too many of those shops sticking around. What would be distinctive about that versus your typical fare in South Korea? Well, now it's much more prevalent. When we started 10 years ago, it was much less. So, you know, the traditional American food where I, mean, I guess one of the biggest differences was that each person gets one plate. Each person has an individual plate. And that was something that was really hard for us. We went into it and we wanted it to be like maybe a New World French bistro, something like that, where the plates aren't as suited towards sharing. We're selling burgers for a while. I would have a table ask me, can you cut this burger into three for me? Because I want to share it with my friends. And I'd be like, I don't even know how to do that. Right? <laughs> like, how do you cut a burger into three pieces, three equal pieces? Cut a burger? What are you doing? <laughs> just, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> Grab it with both hands and you just eat it, right? You know? <laughs> it was something we really struggled with. And so knowing your avatar, knowing who's coming in, it's a huge part of knowing how to design your services. And we worked around it. We made larger format dishes and changed things around. We got the burgers off the menu because, you know, <laughs> we didn't want to deal with it. But knowing who's coming in and knowing how your service works for them and really how they want to use your service. You might have some grand idea in your mind, but you have to be open to seeing what you're avatar wants from you and how they want to use it and then being flexible enough and smart enough to change. You know, don't be stubborn, right? Yeah, for sure. And I think you're really bringing a big point home here, Andrew. And I've seen this firsthand in my own business activities is, look, this whole avatar is a critical piece and it's crucial for knowing how to only attract the clients you really want and your business is going to serve really well. And again, it's going to harken back to giving you those profit margins that make this whole thing really work, especially from a financial independence arrangement. But the difficulty in all niching, all specializing is knowing who to niche in, who to specialize in, who's the right avatar, who's the right person. And you'll have ideas of, oh, I think this would be a really good client. Let's focus our efforts on trying to attract them. And you might attract a few of those people and then you find out you don't particularly like that client. <laughs> like this. Or there's challenges associated with the client that you weren't expecting. And maybe back to Andrew's point here, that his client wants not just a single burger, they want it cut up into threes. And so now you have a wrinkle in your situation that you either you have to adapt for or work around altogether, or you just choose not to work with it, you take the burgers off the menu. So in our own circumstance and within financial planning, we started out more very broad, perhaps no surprise here if anyone's been listening to the episodes, I haven't always practiced what I'm now preaching. <laughs> so <laughs> that's probably why I'm preaching it <laughs> now. <laughs> Don't do what I did. Or boy, if I had to do it all over again, I wouldn't go about it the same way for sure. We initially thought that just simply being a fee-only financial advisory firm would be fairly distinctive and attractive. And that would just sell. Oh, it's just going to sell. Why would you work with someone who's only commission-based and potentially has a conflict of interest in this arrangement and can only work with you at the end of the day? You walk out the door with some sort of product of theirs, usually insurance or investments. You know, if you're just looking for good advice, wouldn't you just pay a fee for that? And the truth is, some people are certainly willing to do that, and they are looking for it. But that distinctiveness, I came to learn, was not nearly as distinctive as I thought it was. And it wasn't quite as compelling of a selling point as I had hoped it to be. Because people don't know what it is. <laughs> no, that's probably true. <laughs> the general consumer does not know what fee-only advice is. So sure. yeah, it's not the selling point that a lot of financial advisors think it is. And when that happened, how did you move away from that? How did you evolve to where you are now? I don't know if I would say we moved away from it because it's still very much a distinctive part. And the circles in which we work within and we only see leads for the business are still have that as all a distinctive issue. But even if that is a distinctive part and it is something that's attracting the client, guess what? I'm not the only fee-only advisor in the country, right? So it only takes you so far along before now you're still back at this issue of competition and you've got a whole bunch of other people who are doing the same thing. And when someone 
you know, very basically, they're going to be like, what are you going to do for me that this next person can't or won't or isn't willing to do? And so this is why we have to specialize. We need to continue to be distinctive. A lot of it just comes into human psychology. I read a study a number of years ago that I just found fascinating. And I don't have the book here to be able to reference this immediately, although I think it's definitely within behavioral finance. And I think actually one of the psychology lectures I had listened to on The Great Courses, if you're familiar with that program, the short of it is they say in psychology that humans are guilty of reason-based thinking. So what does that mean? What it means is we like to attach our decision-making to very distinctive considerations why we think this is a good or bad decision. So if in a psychology experiment, two people were given a choice A or choice B of potential foster parents, and one foster parent had really good aspects, but also really bad aspects. They were charitable. They made a lot of money. They had a beautiful home. They were able to be good providers, but they also worked hours. They were often gone. They were away from the house. They liked to drink a little too much alcohol. I mean, just things that you both, you were like, oh, that's really good about that person, but oh, I'm not so sure about this as well. And then you had this other individual who was just kind of bland, nothing. You know, they're just like, yeah, they made a job, they had a home, but weren't really involved. It just was just, uh. And then they were asked, you know, which one would you choose to have as your foster parent and which one would you choose not to have as your foster parent? And the one who was more distinctive won out in both regards. They were both the person that people chose to have and were the one that they chose not to have. And the person who was fairly bland just simply lost. And what I took from that and what I'm sharing with you and the reason why I'm committing time to it is we need to be distinctive and we need to be able to give reasons, selling points that people can attach and identify within themselves of why they're going to work with you as a way for them to make sense in their own mind that this is a good decision. Even if those points, those reasons aren't even all that valid or legitimate or substantial, one could maybe criticize them and say, objectively, these actually aren't all that meritorious. It doesn't really matter. This is actually how human beings tend to think we attach our decision-making to very specific, critical items. And so if you're going to be in business, you have to be distinctive. And you'll see this in our financial advisory space where someone will be like, I specialize in physicians or the medical community. And so people, if they're needing to make a decision between perhaps two fee-only advisors and one just works with everybody, but then one works and specializes in just physicians and this person happens to be a physician. And even though in reality, the one who specializes in physicians may actually really not do anything different than the one who doesn't specialize in physicians, just the sheer fact that this one does specialize in physicians now is going to win in this competition between who to go with and who not to go with. And so in our space, we started off in the fee-only advisory arrangement, saw that as being distinctive, but as more people have moved into this space, that became less distinctive and less of a selling point. You know, I am only a Catholic. My family's Catholic and I've always practiced. So we had a religious component to our business. I don't think anything that's too prominent, but, you know, for those who were seeking that out, it's there. And for those who aren't, it's also, we're certainly fine and happy to work with people who aren't. It's not a meaning for us, but it's not something that's a deal breaker if it's not a point of meaning for others. But, you know, as distinctive as that might be, okay, we'll work with other Catholics. Not every Catholic has the same financial situation. Uh, so it's only so distinctive and so helpful. And then some of the people that I've had the worst interactions with have been with with other Catholics. So, I mean, it's, it's not as if you're necessarily bringing in the very best of clients, you know, just because they are checking some of those boxes for you. So as time has gone along, as we've gotten to know clients and we've adapted, we've gone more into student loans and student loan advising. We've been decisive and working more distinctly with younger clients rather than older clients in terms of retirees. You know, there's both good and bad in that arrangement. But, you know, if someone's wanting to work with an advisor who primarily works with younger clients, we certainly will win out in that arrangement. I think here of late, it's maybe no surprise with us having this podcast about entrepreneurship. We're working more towards folks who are seeking to develop entrepreneurial interest that they have. And so maybe they have a business on the side or they're wanting to get a business on the side or they'd like to transition out of the work into a business. We've seen interest in that. And then we just have our own interest in that space. And so we're now developing that as a point of distinction of help that we can provide to folks. But we're still seeking. It's definitely not a done deal for us. We've seen a lot of success in working very closely in the student loan space. But even in the student loan space, as nuanced as that is, there's even further distinctiveness amongst the potential clients who would walk through the door who have student loans. And so this avatar, I suppose what I'm trying to say, is almost like the pot at the end of the rainbow. It's always elusive. You're always chasing after. Maybe it is a little bit like one of the little blue men <laughs> in the movie. You know, They're hard to spot and go after and capture because 
every time you think you're a little more under their trail and you're ready to nab them, things change and you have to adjust and there's something else about them that's elusive. But then, you know, I think that's part of the fun to keep with the adventuresome analogy or theme of entrepreneurship. This is what makes this an enjoyable. It's an enjoyable chase, a little bit of game of cat and mouse. I don't know if it's cat and mouse. Is it, our clients don't necessarily come back on us, at least they haven't yet, but we have fun trying to figure out who that avatar is and trying to nab them. What did you take away from all that, Andrew? I think it's really good what you said in terms of having the idea of who your avatar is evolve, especially like you were talking about business owners or that we start working with younger people, but that has its challenges, right? Most financial advisors, they go after the older people at or nearing retirement because, hey, those people have money and they need help. Sure. So that's the part of the market that gets the most attention. But of course, with that also comes the most competition and you might not be interested in that, right? So having an avatar, maybe for us, it's those young entrepreneurs that have interests that are similar to ours. Not only will you then be better positioned to serve them, you'll also find yourself in a business that you probably enjoy more. You know, Ben and I probably would not enjoy just getting down into the dirt on people's insurance policies or helping people that are struggling with really intense debt management stuff. It's just not really what's exciting for us. So a lot of our clients are not really hugely focused on that. Besides from the student loans, that's a whole nother beast, but that's a really important thing to work with. So being able to have that dialed in idea of the avatar is really good. And so at this point, I think we've only got a few minutes left. We've talked a lot about why the avatar is important and what knowing the avatar will allow you to do. But we haven't really talked about how to design that avatar and some of the real concrete how to. So do you want to get into that a little bit before we let everyone go? Yeah, that sounds good, Andrew. So let's talk about, we've got about five steps here to jump through and give you some ideas on. Five steps in five minutes. <laughs> Not a problem. I'm up for the challenge. So step one, what are the goals and the values of the avatar? We've hit upon this some, but what does the avatar want? What kind of product or service are they interested in or looking for? And this varies. Human beings aren't the same. So part of your avatar is finding out what is it this very specific individual that you're hoping to do business with is wanting out of you. And why is that important to them? And so a lot of this needs to harken back, not what's important to you. That can be a mistake of a business owner. You're you're build a business about what you find important. Well, that's great, but you're not going to be in business with yourself. (laughs) You need to find what's important to your avatar because they're going to be the one who's going to ultimately transfer or exchange money for the product and service. So what's important for them? That's what matters most and nailing that down. And then we need to start figuring out just what are some of the attributes of this person. And could be helpful if you already have a very specific client in place that you like working with. And you're like, this is who I really want to be as my model client, my ideal client. I want to go and just replicate them as much as possible. What's their industry? What's their background? You know, what's their income? What do they like to do for fun? You know, where are they at in their life cycle? Do they have kids? Do they not have kids? Do they like to travel? Are they on the internet all the time? Do they want to look in magazines? There's different distinctive characteristics. We need to flesh out this person. Like, what is it that they do? Why do we need to do that? Because we have limited resources for marketing and advertising. And when we use those resources, we want to be able to pinpoint very specifically where we want to be making our promotion known and trying to attract someone's attention so that ultimately that can bring that person in. And at the end of the day, you can generate a sale off of that. So we can't just throw this out to everybody because it can ultimately be very ineffective. And so to know exactly where to advertise, to know exactly where to market, to know exactly where to get your name out, And not to minimize those costs, you need to know exactly where your ideal people like to congregate and what they like to do. So when you promote yourself, they hear your message. You want to be hunting with a sniper rifle rather than a shotgun, really. And really, as a small business owner, most of these people will be starting out. You want to make sure that every one of your marketing dollars are being used as efficiently as possible. And what you're talking about, it reminds me of an interview we had with not a client, it was just with someone that we knew, that we knew that this was really our avatar. And we thought we knew our avatar really well, but having this interview with this couple was incredibly insightful. They gave us a lot of great information. And now we really make it a point to speak with as many of our clients as possible in that way 
and really just ask them those obvious questions. What do you want from this engagement? What are you looking for? Because as much as you think you understand, you might not, right? No, I mean, doing what they call market research, which, you know, market research could be like, hey, I just want to take you out to dinner or for lunch or something, would you like to give me 30 minutes of your time? That's market research, folks. So don't read too much into that term. I mean, it could be more analytical or data driven, but at least certainly within our work, it's let's just take someone out to lunch that we'd like to maybe work with and see if they'd share a little more about themselves. It's getting that feedback and completing the loop and hearing firsthand. We now have it as part of our process that when, as a, someone closes out an engagement, one that's transactional in nature, we set up a separate meeting once the engagement's closed just to have them tell us how did we do and what could we have done better? What did you really enjoy? And then also, what are the next steps for maybe a future engagement for you later down the road? So super valuable. We've learned a lot from that. And part of identifying your avatar is giving them a chance to speak you know, back to you so they can tell you. You don't have to take the guesswork out of it. Let them just simply tell you what it is that they want. <laughs> so you don't have to try to read their minds, right? Yeah. Marketing doesn't have to be an echo chamber. You can actually just like walk <laughs> up to people and say, what do you want? What can I do for you? And you know... <laughs> That's one of the benefits to knowing where they are, right? If you think that your avatar is this person, all right, figure out where do they live on the internet? Where are they? Blogs, forums, Facebook groups. And you can go there and start an account and see what are the most common questions and comments and what is the marketing done on that site? What does that look like? And that'll give you a lot of clues as to what you should be doing also. Right. And I think probably the last point I want to have on here as we start to close this out is If you're not familiar with this, and maybe we could use this as a segue for a future episode, you need to have what's called your sales funnel. So your avatar is the ideal client that you want to walk through and come into the door. But there's usually a process in which you see someone for the first day that someone hears or learns about you is not usually the day that you make the sale with them and you close business. Especially in our business, there's a one month, a six month, a one year, a couple of year delay between the time that they first got introduced to us (laughs) to the time that they say, yes, I'd like to move forward. Let's shake. Part of your whole marketing and sales is that entire sales funnel, that whole pipeline. And part of then working with your avatar is to know what at each stage in this sales process, in this sales funnel, what are we needing to deliver and give to them to move them up into the next stage to get them one step closer to that sale. This isn't just simply finding the avatar. You need to find the avatar and you need to incorporate that avatar into your sales funnel, into your sales process and then flesh that out as well. So we can take them from getting to know you, which is just really broad level marketing to, hey, let's do business. I really like what you have to offer. And I think you're the right person for me. And that's the sales component of sales and marketing. So yeah, let's leave it at that, Andrew, because I feel like that's just a nice segue into sales funnels and how to incorporate your avatar within that. Hopefully you guys have found a lot of value and enjoyed the episode. I've learned a little bit about finding your avatars, not finding Nemo, and it's not a little blue men. But perhaps it's not all that different either <laughs> for both of those because there's finding Nemo, you still got to find your avatar. So I mean, they have similar concepts. So I think forever in my life, Andrew, now I'm going to think of finding avatars, the combination of finding Nemo and, and the movie avatar. What do you think? No? <laughs> I think we've created a really nice, a really nice error for you to have on a daily basis. Your children and wife will love this. Yes. <laughs> Great. I'll watch Finding Nemo with the girls and then I'll watch uh, the Avatar movie with my wife, Deb. So we'll have, I don't know. We'll see. We'll have to talk about Deb in the next step. So see if she's okay with that. <laughs> so you'll tell her about it. Yeah. Finding yeah. the little blue men. <laughs> yeah, right. For sure. All right. Well, folks, thanks for joining us today and stay tuned. Certainly reach out via our website if you think we can be of any help to you. And we'd love to hear your feedback to open up that feedback loop. If you guys have any ideas of what would be a good idea, resource or topic that you'd want us to dig into and provide, please reach out and let us know. We'd love to do that. So in the meantime, everyone take care and we'll be in touch. See you now. Thanks for listening. I hope you've had as much fun as we did. If you'd like to learn more about any of the subjects we spoke about, please visit our website for show notes, links, and more. Hit like, subscribe, or whatever button you've got in front of you to show some love. Remember, the information presented in this podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Remember what Teddy Roosevelt said about the person who strives greatly. If he fails, at least he fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. Until next time, keep striving. Thanks again, and be well.